What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. All right. So before I get into this video, I want to give a shout out to Aram for his contribution to the channel. And um, Aram left a message saying, uh, "Hi, Mike. Please accept this small uh, contribution." And you know, like I say, uh, any contribution is a welcome one and a very, very uh, you know, I'm grateful for it because, you know, any smaller content creator on YouTube uh, will tell you how, from a financial perspective, like YouTube has really um, done a number in, 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 on smaller content creators. And um, there's a lot of things that have gone on even more so now where they are basically essentially robbing us, you know. But at the same time, I don't want to sit there and cry the blues, you know what I'm saying, because we all got, you know, situations where things are unfair. But YouTube does have policies that hurt smaller content creators as opposed to a couple years ago. Um, but going on, you say that um, I'm a 61-year-old white guy who grew up in the South Bronx and saw all the great ones. I saw Dr. J and Connie Hawkins play at Rucker. To this day, my favorite player. Yeah, Connie Hawkins, uh, by the time, you know, his career was delayed because of the scandals, and by the time, you know, he had his stint with the ABA, by the time he actually went to the NBA, I believe Connie Hawkins was already 28 years old. And he was an old 28, like, uh, with, and he already had nagging injuries at that time, which had taken away a lot of his explosiveness. He still was a great player, but he wasn't the same player that he was just two, three years earlier. Um, I guess a guy that you can kind of compare him to with injuries and how they kind of robbed him at a younger age is maybe a guy like Amari Stoudemire. Like, Amari Stoudemire... By the time he came to the Knicks, was probably about that age, maybe twenty eight, twenty nine, and he had like maybe one or one good year or two decent years, and then that was it, you know. Um, but Connie Hawkins was amazing from all of the uh, tales about Connie Hawkins from every perspective of people who watched him play in his prime. He was absolutely amazing. Perhaps in the future you can do a video on who you thought were the most dominant small forwards. The special guys who could take control of the entire court. Like a Dr. J, a Larry Bird, a Elgin Baylor. Uh, thanks and stay safe. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of great small forwards. In the history of the NBA, you can argue, you can make a strong argument that the small four position is probably the most talented and the most dominant uh, as far as enrichment, as far as talent is concerned, position in the history of the NBA. And it's, it makes sense because it's a tweener position. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a very pivotable, uh, excuse me, a pivotal, a pivotable, it's a very pivotable, uh, listen here, son, it's a very pivotable, goddamn nigger lips getting in the way sometimes. <laughs> I say, I say, son, it's the most pivotable, uh, hey, bro, you lay, uh, son, you, you're not paying attention to what I'm saying there, boy. Nah, but, uh, the small four position is one of the most pivotal. Got that out. Pivotal. You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes, you ever have like those words that sometimes you just slip up on? You know, you, you know the word in your head. Pivotal. But your mouth will go, pitable. <laughs> oh, God. But anyway, the small four, small four position is one of the most important positions <laughs> in basketball. Because, you know, it's it's... An X factor. It's like one of those, you know, the wing position is one of those positions where you, it's the actual position where you're, you're it's a link between 
the front court and the back court. You know what I'm saying? Small forwards often have some skill sets that relate to front court ability, rebounding. You know what I'm saying? Um, the, 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 the small forward is often strong enough to uh, contend with uh, being a, a force on the front court and to sometimes defend against front court players. But oftentimes, small forwards have the speed to uh, be effective against smaller perimeter guys. So the small forward position, uh, and also it's, it's, a, it's a position where you can have a unique skill set which makes you an asset in both the front court and the back court. Um, that's why a guy like LeBron James is so dynamic because he possesses a lot of those skill sets that you see uh, with a guy that's in the small forward position, as is the case with a guy like Larry Bird. He's another one. Uh, another guy would be Elgin Baylor uh, back in the day. You know, say so Elgin Baylor was a tremendous rebounder in his day, averaging, I think, 13.5 rebounds per game for his career. Sensational score. Uh, but he was a tremendously uh, athletic and sp- a very quick guy, you know, with speed that you that you saw only with perimeter guys. So, yeah, that would be a good video idea. But let me segue into what this video is about. Now, I meant to do this video earlier. I'm going to do this video earlier about Charles Oakley and what he said regarding Patrick Ewing. And I wanted to wait. I wanted to wait and think this one through uh, a lot uh, before I did it. And Patrick Ewing, Patrick you know what I'm saying, is, is to me probably a top, to most people, top 30 to maybe 35 all-time player. He's definitely top 50. Um, he's one of the greatest New York Nick of all time. Some will tell you he's the greatest Nick of all time. Um, depending on what generation you're you're talking about. Some will say it's Patrick Ewan. A few a few still might say Willis Reed. You know, even though as a player I think Ewan was better, but Willis Reed has that hardware. So, uh, you know, but Patrick Ewan is great, tremendous, Hall of Famer, you know what I'm saying, dominant. Charles Oakley said that to him, Patrick Ewan is one of the main reasons why the Knicks were not able to get over the hump during their um, glory years in the 1990s. Essentially, to be more precise, he was saying that Patrick Ewan just wasn't able to carry the team on his back and to push them further when needed. And basically, he's, he kind of assumed, he kind of, uh, not assumed, he kind of, uh, inferred that Ewan is, was a bit of a prima donna. He said that Anthony Mason and Ewan did not get along. Uh, he said that a lot of players didn't get along with Patrick Ewan. And um, although I think Oakley kind of dialed some of that back recently when Patrick Ewan announced that he was uh, ill with COVID-19. So that's why I'm a little bit, I waited to do this video because around the time I was going to do this video is when Patrick Ewan announced that he had COVID-19 and the timing would have been bad. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I, I got to speak my mind. I, For the most part, for the most part, I agree with Charles Oakley. Now, is Oak sort of mad, sort of salty at the fact that guys like Patrick Ewing, Latrell Sprewell, uh, Bernard King, you know, didn't really have his back with the, you know, feud between him and James Dolan, and maybe this is kind of fueling it a little bit, probably. But at the same time, this is probably something that Charles Oakley has felt for a while, 
but just didn't really vocalize. But I have to say, and I'm in a you know very unique position to say this because I'm a Chicago Bulls fan. I watched the entire Nick Bulls battles in the 90s, all right, from the early 90s all the way to the end of the decade. And I have one of my best friends. I mean, one of my best friends I've known for over 20 years. In fact, close to a quarter of a century. And, uh, matter of fact, we have known each other for a quarter of a century. And he's a die, well, he was a diehard Nick fan until James Dolan destroyed the team and that killed his spirit and killed his love for the NBA. But, um, so I'm in a unique perspective in this situation. And I have to say, Ewan was great, but he did not step up at times when the team really needed him. Okay, there were times when he was on some great championship level teams. And he was not able to step up to the level needed to win a title that all of the greats have to step up. You have to sometimes play beyond your normal levels. You have to perform at a level that you normally don't perform. You have to play above yourself. You have to reach a a, a, a level that only the all-time great. You can't just play at your normal You have to rise to the occasion, okay, for lack of a better phrase. And oftentimes, Patrick Ewan didn't do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, for instance, um, look, just just, his career numbers, right? Regular season career numbers, I looked them up. Ewan averaged 20.1 points, 9.8 rebounds, shot 50% from the floor, um, I, I want to say, I think it was like something like um, two, two and a half blocks, maybe one steal, maybe one and a half assists for his career or close to two. Um, okay, foul shooter. I think he shot like 73, 74% for his career from the foul line. Good numbers. When you look at his playoff numbers, it's 20.2 points, 10.3 rebounds, 50% shoot. They're basically replicas of what he did in the regular season. That's fine. But when you're in a division that has players of excuse me, a conference, that has a guy like Michael Jordan who has the mentality of a serial killer out there on the basketball court. When you have a guy in your division like Reggie Miller who's a fierce competitor who's known for rising to the occasion, you can't just play within yourself. You have to play at a level and motivate yourself to come out and play at your A game when your team needs you. Okay? Um, now, this isn't to say that Patrick Ewing wasn't tough and didn't bring it out there as far as toughness is concerned. <coughs> <coughs> Patrick Ewing is the same guy that played on a partially torn Achilles tendon. In 99. Until he couldn't go any further. So I'm by no by no means. Am I saying he was a prima donna in that way. Oh I, I hurt my pinky. No 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 no. He wasn't. He No this is. These were old school guys. But what I mean is that. oftentimes Patrick Ewing just did not. You know take it up a notch. For instance. I'm going to give you some examples. Now, 
most people would blame the 1993 Knicks collapse against the Chicago Bulls. What's the main name people bring up? Charles Smith, right? Charles Smith, as we all know, choked at the end or near the end of game five, which was a pivotal game because it was game five. The series was tied at two all and they were at Madison Square Garden. New York had home court advantage and prior to that game, New York had not only not lost at home during the entire playoffs, but if memory serves me correctly, they had a streak of like 26 consecutive home games where they hadn't lost. They were dominant at home that year. And lo and behold, the Knicks lost that game. And it was such a draining loss, the way they lost that game, that game six was almost, it wasn't a blowout, but it was not nearly as competitive as the rest of those games and Chicago came back from a 2 nothing deficit. So most people blame Charles Smith for that. But <clears throat> you kind of have to put the onus on Patrick Ewan. Now, Ewan had great overall stats in that series. I think he averaged 26 and 11. But that's also close to what Patrick Ewan was averaging in the playoffs anyway. And I think they were kind of close to his regular season averages. But there were many times down a stretch of those games where Patrick Ewan wasn't stepping up. He might have 26 points and 11 rebounds, but in the four quarters, in many of those games that they lost, he might have only had two points and four rebounds. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he, he wasn't rising to the occasion. Whereas the Chicago Bulls, if Jordan was having a bad night, guess what? The Chicago Bulls, others, whether it's Scottie Pippen or B.J. Armstrong or Horace Grant, other guys would step up. Now, maybe you should, maybe you would say, okay, well, if Ewan isn't stepping up, maybe some of the other guys should step up. Well, that's the thing. Most people assumed that Patrick Ewan would have a field day against Chicago because that's that was Chicago's weak link, the center position. You know what I'm saying? Um, Elijah destroyed us for the most part. <laughs> so, you know, um, that's why I'm saying Ewan didn't possess that killer in him. You know what I'm saying? I remember in 94, this is when Michael was out of baseball, a basketball, excuse me, playing baseball. And there was a game, a friend of mine had just reminded me of this. I totally forgot about this game. Now, this is 94, when the Knicks went to the NBA Finals. And in the Eastern Conference Finals that year, I think it was game three. When the Knicks could have gone up 3 nothing and taken a commanding lead over the Indiana Pacers. They got blown out by 20 points. The Knicks set a record for fewest, at the time, fewest points scored in a playoff game since the institution of the shot clock 40 years prior. And you only scored one fucking point in the entire goddamn game. One fucking point. One. Now, everybody has bad nights. Everybody. Everybody will have atrocious nights. Even Michael Jordan had some atrocious shooting nights. That's not the point here. The point is, is that it was a consistent thing with Patrick Ewing. He consistently choked 
when his team needed him. Now, ultimately, they did beat the Pacers. But remember the round before that, it took them seven games to beat us without Michael Jordan, which is why I'm 100% certain that if Jordan played that year, we'd have whooped them. We would have whooped the Knicks. We would have whooped the Pacers. And I think we would have beaten the Rockets. But, hey, that's just me. You know what I'm saying? The very next year, what did Patrick Ewan do? Against the Pacers. When his team needed him to score a do-or-die bucket in that game seven, he missed. Now, I know some people say, hey, man, Ewan's legs were done. He was wrapped up. He couldn't get lift. He couldn't get elevation. Look, man, Charles Oakley and those guys... I'm telling you, there's a reason why Pat Riley left that team after Patrick Ewan missed that layup. Because he could sense it. He wasn't going to win with that team. And he wasn't going to win a championship with Patrick Ewan. The year before that, I skipped over the 94 NBA Finals. The Knicks had home court advantage that year. Many people <clears throat> blamed John Starks for the loss. They blamed John Starks for the loss because of his terrible Game 7 performance. And he does share blame for it. But you know who really gets to blame for that is Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing in the 94 Finals, the entire 1994 NBA Finals, shot only 36% from the floor. And it wasn't just because of Elijah Wan's stellar defense. It was because of his stupid, stupid decision-making sometimes. And people know this from watching Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing had this tendency to shoot over a double team. He did it all the fucking time. Elijah Wan could be on him. And somebody like, I don't know, uh, Robert Dory or somebody could come over and help defense. And Patrick Ewan will, come over, will, will shoot over the fucking help defense. Instead of passing... to the man that Robert Ory was guarding. And, you know, another thing about Patrick Ewing, he had small hands, he didn't have good hands, he wasn't a really good passer. So that was a really a knock on him too. But he shot only 36% from the fucking floor, man. And, I mean, not only did he not, not only did he only shoot 36% from the floor in that series, he was a shot jacker by his standards in that series. And they were daring, almost daring Ewan to shoot the basketball. And Ewan was missing and missing and missing and missing and missing. Okay? There were multiple games where he shot 9 for 29, 8 for 28, 11 for 27. You know, I mean, he only averaged 18 points a game in that series. That's why they lost. Even though... It went seven games, and even though they only lost game seven by six points, Ewing shot like shit. Starks choked in game seven, but let's not forget that John Starks was one of the main reasons why they won in game five. I think Starks had like 30 points or something like that in game five. And Starks, before Game 7, I think was averaging 26 points a game on 42% shooting. For him, that's great. So, to me, the onus, it was on Ewing to step up against the spectacular Akeem Olajuwon, and he did not. He got severely outplayed by Olajuwon, and they lost by a, a, a little insky, insy-bincy bit. 
So at the end of the day, for the most part, I agree with Charles Oakley, man. I think that Patrick Ewan um, should have won a lot more than he did, okay? Um, I think that they probably should have won a championship in 1993, and they definitely should have won a title in 94. Ewan should have at the very least one championship ring to show for his career. And you can argue that in 1997, if it wasn't for that fight and the NBA unfairly penalizing the Knicks over the heat, if you remember that series, there were some suspensions, and many, and almost everybody will tell you outside the Miami Heat fans <laughs> that the suspensions uh, hurt the Knicks a lot more than Miami because of the value of the players that were suspended. In 97, I think that the Knicks – Probably should have played the Bulls in the Eastern Conference Finals that year. Um, but, yeah, at the end of the day, um, I think that Ewing should have won more. Now, I know there are going to be some people but that's going to say, like, well, look, Michael uh, won championships and prevented a lot of people from having better legacies. Reggie Miller, uh, you know, Carl Malone, John Stockton. You know, Charles Barkley, you know, Sean Kemp. I get it. But the Knicks and the Bulls played each other so often. And the Knicks had a serious matchup advantage at that center position. Now, there were a few games where I saw Patrick Ewan play above and beyond himself. And in those few games where I saw him do it, and Jordan wasn't able to muster one of those superhuman 40, 50 point efforts, and he wasn't getting the supporting cast uh, help, those are the few games I saw New York beat the shit out of us. But they were few and far in between. There were too many games where I saw Patrick Ewing Settle for 20 footers. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, Ewan is 7 of 17 from the floor. And the Knicks are down by three. I really hope Ewan doesn't start trying to take it going in the post. You know what I'm saying? I hope he just doesn't. I hope he just settles for these outside shots. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I would rather have him do that than go in the paint and, 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 you know, establish himself in the post and give us some real problems. And guess what? Ewan would just settle for that 20-footer. And we come back and win. So, that's what I got to say, man. I know there are going to be a few people that just, just, just going to disagree with me, but Watching Patrick Ewing. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't a great player. He was. But he could have been greater. And I'll say this to end this video. That's why I always say the playoffs, to me, is when you impress me. When you can elevate your game consistently in the playoffs, that's when I think you're an all-time legend. So, that's it. Tell me what you guys think.